Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church of Clifton. It is a joy to be here. It is a joy to welcome you here today. And as we come together to worship, we are reminded that we are in God's house. We are in God's presence. And as we worship together today, I pray that you will be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in your life, that you will be open to how God is speaking to you and what God is saying. If there is something in your life that you need to let go of, change, put down, uh, listen, listen to what the Lord might be saying about that. If there's something that needs to be added to your life, some new mission, some new ministry, some new openness, then uh, pay attention to how the Lord speaks to you. And if today is the day that you need to recommit your life to Jesus Christ, having already done that, but, but maybe pulled away some or, or not paid much attention in recent times, or if, you, uh, if you're feeling led to join with this congregation, if you're a member in some other place, a different denomination, a different United Methodist Church, and you live in this area now and want to come and be part of this congregation, I invite you. Or if you've never said yes to being a follower of Jesus Christ in any formal or official way, and that is where God is moving you today, I pray that you will that you will respond to the Lord. And since this is our commitment Sunday, I pray that all who haven't already made a response to that will do so today and, uh, and, or if you're not ready today in the next few days so that we will be able to build our, build our church plan and uh, decide what we are able to do in the coming year. Let us begin our worship. wedding and we want to thank Van Chaney this morning for playing for our uh, service this morning. He also played for uh, Johnny Kleine's funeral on Friday and we just appreciate him so much and he's so uh, very talented and, and uh, it's always a pleasure to have him. If you would give him a round of applause please. Our hymn is, O for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Let us stand as you are able this morning.
please remain standing and join with me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he descended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and if the children will come. So good to see you guys today. Good morning. You all right? Okay. And thank you for acolyting those who, those who lit the candles this morning. That's an important part of our service. And um, I, don't, I don't know, have, have people explained to you what it means when we bring the light in and light the candles? And what it means when we take the light from the candles and take it back out at the end of the service? All right, let me, let me explain a couple of things. One is that, and I've mentioned this before in worship, I know that the two candles are up here not just to add balance to the, to the altar table, but also because we remember that Jesus was completely divine, Jesus was completely God, and while he was here on earth as Jesus, he was completely human, both at the same time. That's something that isn't possible for us, so it's, you know, it's something that it doesn't make any kind of sense in our heads, but it was something that was true of, of that one person, Jesus Christ. So we have the two candles. And when, when y'all come in with the, with the lighted candles on the, you know what the official name for that instrument is, that, that piece of metal that y'all carry in? You know what the official liturgical correct church name for that is? Those are called candle lighters. <laughs> I've looked it up and that's true. Okay, so you, you carry in the candle lighter and it's already lighted because the, the flame represents the light of Christ, the light of Jesus in the world. So you bring that in and you light the candles so that we can start the service. And anytime we're having a worship service in here, we have those candles lighted so that we are reminded that Jesus is present. Now, would Jesus be here whether we had the candles lighted or not? Yes. But, uh, but we do that to remind ourselves. There are a lot of things we have to do to remind ourselves because we forget. Okay, so we remind ourselves about that. And then at the end of the service, when you come with the candle lighter and you come up and you light the candle lighter again from the candle, and then you turn the candle lighter around and you use the candle snuffer and you put out the flame on the candle, but the lighter is still lit, right? So when you carry your candle lighters out, that's us taking the light of Christ back out into the world. So when we finish worship, we take the light of Christ with us as we go out into the world. And that's what, that's what that symbolizes. That's what that symbolizes and what that means, okay? Symbolizes is a good word for you to know. It's something that kind of stands for, represents something else. All right? Okay. Well, let's have a prayer and y'all can go and learn some cool stuff, all right? Thank you, God, for this day, for this life, for my home, for my family, for my church, for my school, for all of the people who take care of me. Please bless me. Please help all of them. And help me to be good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. See you guys later.
and if the ushers would please come. Holy God, as we come to you today, we come giving you a part of what you have given us. We know that it's all yours, and we know that it's on loan to us. We ask that we would use it wisely, and that what we return to you through the church would be used wisely and well, that its power would be increased, and that your kingdom might be well served, not only through this gift, through these tithes, through these offerings, but also through all we do, all we say, all we have, and all we are. In Jesus' holy name, amen.
as we come to prayer time this morning, um, a couple of additions to the list of requests. If you would please add the family of Terry Dickinson, that's Pat Johnson's stepfather who passed away, and so prayers for their family at this, at this sad time. Also for the family of Deborah Smith, um, a woman who lived here in Clifton, and a lot of you, I think, knew her. Um, and of course, continuing <coughs> prayers with the Kleine family, Johnny's service was here on Friday and a great celebration of her wonderful life and uh, a sharing of the sadness of her passing. Um, we had two members who had surgery this past week and are still recovering. So just, just prayers for Don Whitney and for Lynn Bowers um, and continuing prayers for um, Judy Sisson as she recovers from knee surgery. Um, prayers for surgery this week for, first of all, Macy Kelly, uh, the justice's little granddaughter, um, is having surgery tomorrow morning. Um, I believe at one of the hospitals in Waco, but I'm not sure which one. And then on Wednesday, um, Carolyn Flanagan is going to have some back surgery down in Austin. So if you would, if you would hold all of, all of these in prayer and add them to your prayer list, that would be most appreciated. Let us go to God now in prayer. Holy Lord, as we come before you this morning in worship, we bow in prayer to acknowledge your greatness, to acknowledge your majesty, to acknowledge your nature of love and forgiveness and justice, and to ask, Lord, that we might be made worthy by you to, um, to even undertake the task of worship and to honor you and glorify you in every way we possibly can, but trust in you to do all that is necessary that, uh, that we lack and where we fall short, we know that you fill in the gaps. As we come before you, we confess our weakness, we confess our selfishness, we confess our sin and our separateness from you. We ask, Lord, that you would not only forgive us, but help us to turn, help us to repent, help us to change our lives so that they might indeed reflect you and be more like you. As you lead us, Lord, we give you thanks for, for the forgiveness which is before us and ask that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to claim and to own that forgiveness and to live into that sanctifying life which you lay out before us. Lord God, we pray for all of those who have been mentioned this morning, those who are on our prayer list, those who are not listed or named out loud, but who are in our hearts and so in need of your presence, of your help, of your healing. We ask, Lord, that you would mend and restore minds and bodies and spirits that have been broken, relationships that have been torn asunder and lives that have been shattered. We ask, Lord, that as you look over this entire world of, of your children, that you would help us to see the goodness and do the right, and that you would, that you would turn us away from any, any thought or act or, or method of doing evil or hurt to one another. Lord God, especially for those whose intention is against you and against your people, we seek a powerful transformation of their, their mind and their heart and help us, Lord, to make a difference where we don't even know that we're making a difference in making the world a better place for all of your children. Be with those who are frontline defenders and responders, those who are caregivers and nurturers in all of the ways that work to prevent people falling off the track and going in the wrong direction. 
and those who stand between evil and innocence to protect and to defend. Lord God, we pray your strength. We pray your courage. We pray your wisdom from on high. And as we join together, we ask that we might have in us the mind that was in Christ Jesus and that we might pray together as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Our scripture for this morning comes from the Gospel according to Luke, and it's one of those um, one of those scripture references that makes us go, "What?" Uh, it just it's like, how does that make any kind of sense? And scholars have struggled with this one throughout the centuries, trying to trying to figure it out and uh, and understand what kind of message Jesus was giving. So as always, we need to consider the context. This comes right after the story of the prodigal son, which, um, which follows quickly after the stories of the lost coin and the lost sheep. So it, uh, it has to do with, with God's emphasis and God's stress, God's focus, God's importance given to specific, specific things. And, um, and the specific thing that we're talking about 
in all of this, and then chapter 16, the part I'll be reading and the part after that, it all has to do with the use of money. Our Methodist founder, John Wesley, back in the 1700s, had a sermon that he preached often as, as he traveled, the thousands of miles he traveled to take the good news to people. And one of, one of those sermons, it's number 50 in his, in his sermon list, but uh, one of those sermons was called The Use of Money because Wesley was a very practical person, just like Jesus was a very practical person. And living out the faith in the real world with real people and in a real way and looking at what we as individuals need to do with our lives. Now, um, yeah, okay. So we, uh, we come into this particular scripture and Jesus also said to the disciples, now this he's teaching specifically to the disciples, but there were other people overhearing it too. A certain rich man heard that his household manager or steward in other translations was wasting his estate. He called the manager in and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me a report of your administration because you can no longer serve as my manager. We're auditing the books and you're out of here. Uh, the household manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is firing me as his manager? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm too proud to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I am removed from my management position, people will welcome me into their houses. One by one, the manager sent for each person who owed his master money. We don't know whether these were tenants of land that he owned, whether they were people who had borrowed money. We, we don't know that. Uh, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And the man said, 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager said to him, take your contract, sit down quickly and write 450 gallons. Then the manager said to another, how much do you owe? He said, 1,000 bushels of wheat. And the steward said, take your contract and write 800. So he takes 450 gallons of oil off of the first. He takes 200 bushels of, uh, of wheat off of the next. And, uh, and so on, you know, it only gives two examples. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted cleverly. And we go, what in the world is Jesus doing there? People who belong to this world are, are more clever in dealing with their peers than are people who belong to the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful with little is also faithful with much. And the one who is dishonest with little is also dishonest with much. If you haven't been faithful with worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you haven't been faithful with someone else's property, who will give you your own? No household servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to the one and have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. There's a lot of this that in today's context doesn't make sense to us. So uh, let's be thankful that God gives us the word and let's go to God in prayer. Lord God, we ask that you would illumine our hearts, that you would illumine this scripture, that you would help us to see and know and understand the message that you are giving to us today and how we are to live and operate in this world. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, empower these words, and empower our hearing so that whatever, whatever I speak will become what we need to hear. And where I fail to speak your word clearly and truthfully, you will plant that truth in the hearts of each of us, your hearers. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right. 
So uh, this is the scripture that John Wesley used when he preached sermon number 50, wherever, wherever he was preaching. And his, his point was, he didn't get into all the sticky wicky about, uh, well, the management this, and this was so and so and that. It's very clear in Wesley's understanding and in the understanding of most scholars that the manager here is a worldly, I mean the owner, is a worldly owner, not God, okay? The, and when the owner calls the, the steward or the slave to account, um, he's, he's not doing that as Jesus or as God. He's doing that on a, on a, a material plane in this world. And in this world and on the, uh, on the material plane, the, the dishonest steward, the dishonest slave or manager was very clever because he was caught dead to rights, squandering his master's property. And he, uh, he figured that there wasn't any way out of it except this shrewd kind of way. And shrewdness was, um, was an honored kind of uh, talent. In, in the days back then, Jacob, one of the patriarchs, was shrewd. Um, but God takes that shrewdness with Jacob and, and works on it and helps Jacob become not only shrewd but also good eventually. But in this case, the, the steward isn't good and the master isn't good. They're, they're involved in, in commercial enterprise and they're doing what makes sense in a, in a worldly kind of way. And, um, and so what Jesus is saying as, as he tells this story, he, he has the, the dishonest steward use his cleverness and his dishonesty to uh, make friends for himself, for himself so that he'll have some place to go when he, when he actually is walked out the door at the, at the owner's place. And what Jesus is saying is, look folks, you are children of light. You are the ones who have the good news. You are the ones who have the truth of God. You are the ones who know the things of the Lord. But you're not as, as clever with the things of the Lord as the worldly and dishonest are with the things of the world. Because look how this man is using what he has access to, to set up his future. And how much are you, the children of light, using what you have been given to establish your future in being, in being dedicated to and being, uh, being faithful to what God has given you? So, like I say, Wesley didn't even spend that much time on any kind of explanation of, of this particular scripture. He just kind of takes it as that's, that's what it meant and that we as the children of light need to get smart, get clever, get dedicated to using what God has given us the way the dishonest steward used what he had access to to, to fix his life and future. So Wesley immediately goes into talking about the things that he sees as the proper way to handle money. And um, I, I offer to you that one of, one of the people in, in the modern day world who talks a lot about proper use of money and teaches people proper use of money and how to, how to handle what we have and how to uh, gain maximum benefit and at the same time maximum goodness through, through who we are in relationship to our goods and our resources is Dave Ramsey. And we've, we've had the Financial Peace University classes here and we'll be offering those some more in the future. But on November the 7th, um, from seven till 10 that evening, we're doing a live stream 
of a smart money course. So if any of you want to participate in that, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, if any of you want to participate in that or know somebody who needs to, then um, I, I would, and in, in this particular group, you know, I know y'all well enough to know that, um, that more of you probably know people who need to participate than need to participate yourselves. But if you, can, if you can invite somebody and bring them so that they can learn some more about how to use money and how to use it well and how to use it right. But, uh, but John Wesley is an interesting, an interesting case. Those of, those of you who are aware of the Wesley story, I'll be going over some old territory, but, but for anyone who doesn't, he was the son of an Anglican clergyman. Um, he, the Anglican clergyman, his father Samuel, was not well-to-do at all. He didn't serve a wealthy parish, and he wasn't a good money manager on top of that. In fact, he spent some time in debtor's prison. And he and his wife had a total of 19 children, which, you know, can get costly. But, uh, but Wesley grew up without a lot of stuff, you know, without a lot of material goods but a home rich in love and rich in learning. And then after he graduated from Oxford, he was, he was ordained a priest, but he was invited to come teach there. So he was a fellow and, and then a, a teacher and uh, started earning some income. And the first, the first year he taught, it was, it was 30 pounds, which for him was a whole lot of money. That was for the year. And he... Uh, he did things, that was just his nature, was to do things for other people and to give things away and, and those kinds of things. But, uh, but he, was, he was doing great by, by what he understood of the world. And then um, he, had, he had an encounter one day. He had, gone, he had gone to the market and he had bought a couple of pictures to hang on the wall in his apartment there at the, at the university and um, I have no idea what they were what they were drawings or paintings or what of but he was he was he had gotten them hung and he was admiring those pictures and one of the chambermaids came to do something in the room and he realized that it was cold winter and she didn't have a coat she just had a, a linen dress and that was all that was protecting her from the cold and he immediately reached in his pocket because he was going to give her money to buy a coat and he realized that he didn't have enough because he had bought those pictures and he he uh, in in his own head i don't know that he did it out loud in front of her but he was he was chastising himself for um for having made that choice and therefore being unable to do the help that his, that his compassion led him toward. And so he made, he made a decision, and um, a decision wrapped in, in prayer and scripture and study and thought, because that was the way he made his decisions. And he determined that he would, for the rest of his life, live on the amount he had lived on as a student and be able to give the rest away. And he kept close records of, of what he did. So the, the first year uh, after, after this, his income was 30 pounds for the year. His expenditures were 28, so he had two pounds to give away. And then his income started jumping, and in a couple of years it was 90. He lived on 30 and gave the rest away. Later in his life, he, he wrote a lot of uh, books and pamphlets and those kinds of things, and those sold for a few pennies and, and accumulated uh, a lot of money. Uh, 1,400 pounds, he still lived on 30 and gave the rest away. Um, so what, what he's saying in the sermon, and that's why I'm quoting him instead of quoting Mary Jean, all right? Uh, what he's saying in the sermon, he lived and he practiced, but he didn't insist that other people do it. He wasn't heavy handed about it. He wasn't judgmental about it. He offered this to people as a way to be at peace with their own souls and to be good in their own life. Because the first thing he said was earn all that you can. Earn all that you can. 
uh, whatever your abilities, whatever your gifts, whatever your graces, earn all the money you can. There's no shame in earning a lot of money. He said, now, there's some stipulations to that. First of all, don't do it to your own hurt. Don't put yourself into some occupation that's going to break your body or your mind or your spirit. Don't do anything that is physically harmful, that, that will uh, mess you up in your thinking, that will, that will pull you off course, anything that's dishonest or, or uh, unseemly or, or anything that is not honoring God. All, all is to be wrapped in honoring God. And taking care of your own body and your own health is part of honoring God. So there were some industries at that time that used arsenic in part of their processing. And he's saying, don't work in those. You know, if, uh, if, you, if you know that there's, that there's some ill that can come because of work in that industry, don't work in that. If, and then he said, if it's going to do something harmful to somebody else, don't do it. Don't do something that's using and abusing somebody else, or don't, don't work in an industry that, that, is, that is taking advantage of others or hurting others, mind, body, or spirit. You know, stay, stay away from those occupations and don't do those things. And he also said don't do something that's going to be harmful. Now, this is 1700s, mind you. He says, don't do something that's going to pollute the earth or the atmosphere. Something that's bad for everybody altogether. Don't, don't work in those, in those kinds of situations because that is not of God and that doesn't honor God and that doesn't perpetuate the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so he said, earn all you can. And he said, use what you earn in a wise way. The second rule was save all you can. And that didn't mean stacking up CDs. That meant not spending any more than you had to. Not wasting money on unnecessary uh, frills or accoutrement or any of that sort of thing. Uh, he discouraged wearing a lot of gold and fancy clothes and, and those kinds of things, but did not condemn people for doing that, okay? I, I want us to keep these things straight because this is us talking to us. This was Wesley talking to Wesley. This was Wesley giving, giving uh, the, the good word to people but not being heavy-handed and judgmental about it uh, because people have to grow into this. He, he keeps insisting all through this sermon that you have to pray, you have to think, you have to read, you have to study, you have to use wisdom because you need to preserve your own house and your own household. You need to take care of the needs that you and your family have. You need to make sure that that's solid. That's something else that Ramsey talks about, the, having the four walls secure, not, not giving everything away so that you end up being the person who is in need. If you are a person who's been given the talents to earn so that you can preserve yourself and others. So, so Wesley talks about saving all you can by not, by not spending frivolously and by not overspending on things that you don't actually need. Um, now, in, in our day, in our economy, I, I'm struggling with this all the time and I'm having to think it through because there's so much of the economy of the world that is based on uh, those of us who have the means buying stuff that we don't really need. And oh gosh, how does, how does that work? Because for somebody else to earn a living, I used to think about this when I studied the French Revolution, and they'd talk about all the fancy parties that the king would give and stuff. And I'd think, well, but if the king wasn't giving all those fancy parties, granted, he, he was doing no good for his, for his people as a whole, but, uh, but the people who worked for the king were earning some money making those little pastry things and all that kind of stuff and and that's how they made their living so what would they be doing if it weren't for that there's there's it isn't easy is it 
It isn't easy, it isn't simple. You have, to, you have to think through and you have to think consequences, logical consequences for yourself, logical consequences for the people around you, logical consequences for the world. And darn, we hate to think. It would be so much easier if somebody just gave us some rules and said, do this, don't do that. But it isn't that easy. It isn't that easy. So save all you can. And then what's, what's the purpose? There was a man who had been a member of the first church I served, and uh, he had passed away a few years before I went there, but his widow was still an active part of the church. And I knew from her and from all the people in the community that Fred was a man of tremendous generosity. He had, he had uh, not extravagant wealth, but, but he was, he was well, well set and worked hard and did well. And, um, and one, of, one of the boys in one of the families that Fred and his wife helped, just kind of as a, as a, regular, a regular thing, he told me one time during youth meeting that Fred had, had always said, and here's this teenage boy remembering it and quoting it, that Fred had always said that uh, money was only good for what it could do for others. And that was how he and his wife had lived their lives. They had what they needed as far as needs, conveniences, comfort, those kinds of things. But they were always looking to what, what God needed them to do with their, with their substance for the sake of other people. Um, so the, the last thing is to give all that you can. First you earn it, then you, you save it, you spend it wisely and then you give all that you can for the sake of others. So throughout, throughout his life, John Wesley was always giving to, you know, somebody needed a coat, somebody needed medicine, somebody needed tools to, uh, to learn a trade and work in that trade. What, whatever it was, there, there needed to be a meeting house for the gathering of the societies. They would, they would take care of that. Give all you can. And that is the valid use of money. That's the valid use of our entire lives. For us to look first to the Lord and see what God says about our blessing and taking care of what we need, what we have to have, what, what makes us able to do for other people and to, to be diligent about that and to do it with the Lord's values. Not the values of the dishonest steward, um, but for the Lord's values and for the Lord's hope and for the Lord's future. So as, as we think about this, um, all of us can reevaluate, all of us can look again at what we have, how we, how we use it, how we care for others, how we reach out to others, how we, how we take care of making sure that home base is secure. And one of, one of the other commitments that John Wesley made was that um, he said if he, if he died with more than a certain fairly small amount of money in his possession, then he would consider himself a thief. And when he, when he died after, after uh, 80 years in, in life, when he died, he died with only some change that they found in the drawers of his bureau. And they used that to pay the, the pallbearers to carry, to carry the coffin. Um, now, Wesley was single most of his life, and he lived in a different time and different age. I'm not, uh, do, do you understand that this is not a rule that says you must live on what you lived on as a student? Do you understand that? <laughs> and, and do you understand that this, this is not that you set a certain amount, because I don't know what inflation was doing during the, the better part of a century when Wesley lived, but, uh, but it apparently remained pretty, pretty static and pretty, pretty straightforward. And um, and he didn't have he didn't have children or other people who were who were his household dependents. So 
you know, take all of that into account and don't hear me saying that all of us need to live like John Wesley, that all of us need to live economically like Jesus, but all of us need to live with God foremost in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. That's the point. That's the point. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. All of those things that are about us being thoroughly dedicated to God. And the, the only way we can, we can do that is by being in steady relationship with God, talking to God, listening to God, studying about God, being in association with others who have that same kind of concern, and thinking, thinking, and deciding, and knowing that just because I decide this today doesn't mean that that's the end of God's truth for me. God may reveal something else to me tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, and there may be something new that God is speaking to me. So Lord, may we ever be open to your word speaking to us, your life revealing to us who we are and who we can be. Let us spend our lives so that we are truly ready for the heavenly realms and that we begin that even now as we live together in this world, in this life, and help us to make it a place of your presence for ourselves and for all around us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We have some things coming up. Fire starters, more work on fire starters. Those are things to start fires with. Okay, uh, a little, little waxy thing in a a bit of cotton and you like that and it starts your fire for you. So um, there's another workshop for that at what time Tuesday? Nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. And then this coming Saturday is Fall Fest and we have a spot downtown in front of the Chamber of Commerce bake sale. It's, it's in your bulletin. But, uh, but we need some people to volunteer to work shifts at our booth, so talk to Phyllis Brown about that if you, can, if you can do it. And then on October the 28th, there is an opportunity to uh, kind of get our minds going in another, um, another direction of, of thinking future, and that is uh, to go to a training from 9 o'clock to 4 at First Church Burleson, and we'll take the bus if we have some people that want to go. So talk to me or talk to Phyllis or Michael about going to that on September 28th. That's a Saturday um, about new, new communities of faith and helping to begin those within our church, within our community. And, uh, and how that contributes to the growth of the kingdom of God. So if you have business with the Lord here at the front, if you want to come to the altar, if you want to come and join with us on this journey, I invite you to come as we stand and sing our closing hymn.
now as the Lord leads you, sent into God's sunshine with God's grace and God's mercy. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.